Weren't you just here? And Faye asked, looking up from splitting wood with a bare hand, using it like an axe. He stood outside his little house in the bream wood at the chopping block. His marbled skin had a reflective sheen to it that made you squint when the light was bright. Pretty flowering vines had been cultivated to climb up the timber and frame the door with vibrant blossoms. The roof had been freshly thatched since his last visit. I am early, Dan Moy smiled. I took the short way. Then give me a hand with the wood, Aunt Faye requested. Dan Moy took his coat off, hanging it over an arm, and let his tail make fast work of the wood pile. Most of the way through it, he saw his little niece come running from around the corner of the building. He buried his tail deep in the chopping block and held it firmly there with his mind until he could get his hands on it, to wrap it up in coils and tie it to his waist. Lachine hugged him enthusiastically around the legs with complete disregard for the dangerous blade she was a hand's breadth away from. Dan Moy hurriedly finished his knots and picked her up to kiss her on the forehead. She looked very human, apart from having her mother's silver eyes. Still hobbling yourself? Anvay asked. It's dangerous, Dan Moy responded quietly, plunking Lachine back on the ground. Are you hungry? asked his brother's Tepoy wife, appearing soundlessly from around the corner of the house. Again, when he'd come up behind Lachine, her soft tail with a puff at the end, wrapping itself around her daughter's chest. Her wide doe eyes were friendly enough, accompanied by her warm smile, but he still found himself unsure of what she thought of him. After all, he linked her husband to the outside world, to which human lovers often returned in the legends. It would have been understandable to view him as a potential thief. I am, Damoy said honestly. Come in then, she said. It's not time for the meal, but I should have something to tide you over. Thank you, Damoy said, picking up his coat from where he had hurriedly dropped it in the wood chips and shaking the splinters out of it. He followed them into the cool interior of the house and hung his coat on the back of a chair. Lachine invited herself onto his lap when he sat down, fearless as ever. As she peppered him with questions, she began leaning back and twisting up to look at him, to the point where he had to put an arm around her back to keep her from falling off his knee. What's your name? she asked. Danmoy, he told her. Do you remember me? No, she said happily. Although he'd seen her just a month or so ago, memory in someone her age in the bream was inherently unstable. She remembered only what she interacted with or used every day. He took no offense. But you climb on me anyway? Mommy and Daddy remember you, she babbled to him in Tepoy, taking his hair in her hands and tugging on it. Doesn't your hair get in your eyes? You don't tie it back. Do you climb on everyone who visits? He inquired, as she reached for his glasses and took them off his nose for inspection, leaving grubby fingerprints all across the glass. I don't know. Do I? She asked her parents. Yes, Anne Faye chuckled. Everyone and everything. I'm your uncle, Danway told her, not for the first time. That means your daddy and I had the same mommy, and you have an aunt and a cousin too. We are all family. They just live in a different place. So where do you live? Oh, uh... He found himself stumped by a four-year-old's question. To his annoyance, his brother wasn't tongue-tied at all and proffered a teasing response. Dan Moy, Anfei said, leaning forward on his cupped hands with a smirk, elbows on the table. Lives on his feet because he can't pick a world. Dan Moy's tail fidgeted in its ties, and he stilled it. When he was around others, part of his mind was always on it, sensing its position, its twitches, on guard if it made a break for it. The calmer he kept himself, the calmer it usually stayed. So you don't have a house? Lachine asked. Where do you sleep when it's raining? Under my hat, he answered, before remembering he'd forgotten it at Aha's house. But you don't have a hat. And where do you keep your toys? She inquired with great concern for his welfare. In my pockets, he replied more cleverly. Okay, she said very seriously, taking him at his word as she leaned around him, trying to see where his tail started. When she reached for it, he redirected her hands. Digging into his pockets, he pulled out a pack of crayons and a small sketchbook. A few of the crayons had been broken when he'd been attacked on the raft, but they still worked fine, and their paper wrappers held them together. What are those? she asked. A gift from your cousin Miha, he said, taking a crayon out to draw a little sketch of the cottage he was sitting in. The girl watched with rapt attention and then grabbed the drawing utensil from his fingers to begin drawing her own squiggles on the next sheet of paper. She abandoned him for her own chair to give her gift her full attention, and the adults were given a short break from her boundless energy and need for interaction. So, how's the human world? Anfei asked him as Genwin put bread with clarified butter on the table, along with some dried fruit. Getting along, I suppose, said Dan Moy, putting butter on one of the bread slices. Sorry, but I left before Aha could write you a letter this time. You should really write her one. You said yourself she doesn't read Tepoy, Anfei excused himself. 
and translate. What do I say to a woman I don't remember who never visits? Anfei rolled his eyes. Hello? Danmoy suggested. Tell her about life with Genwin and Lashin and what kind of animal you got the milk for this butter from. Anything, really. She writes to past Danfei, and he isn't here to answer her, her brother shrugged. So, let her get to know you like you are. Like I have, Danmoy said. You know, playing past Danmoy for his sister isn't a way to live, my friend. Anfei came close to cutting him off. It's unhealthy. Just stay here and stop torturing yourself with this business. I can't yet, Danmoy said. Eha had a stash of Anfei's old journals. He considered offering to translate them into Tepoy for his brother to read. But he decided to drop it. Anfei was clear in his decision to abandon his past life. This is for you, Lachine interrupted, pushing him a stick figure drawing with a long, scary tail done in broad strokes of black and blue. Danmoy took it and inspected it closely as she watched. I will treasure this portrait, he told her. Good, she said, and began to draw one of her mother. How's life in the Breamwood? Anfei made a face that meant something annoying was going on, and tugged at one of the Tepoya-style lengths of hair hanging down to frame his face. They were looped at the ends and held fast by long strips of red leather. All of his clothing was of Tepoya style, made from this world. His pants were made with a typical lavender cloth from a kind of woody grass they cultivated in the shade of the Breamwood, and his shirt was the loose, wrinkled, off-the-shoulder pattern but he still wore the same thumb rings as Dan Moy, which they'd bought before their first trip into the Bream. He'd accepted it as evidence of some kind of kinship when Dan Moy had found him again, even if he'd looked at him like a stranger and feigned disinterest in his world of origin. Raiders are starting to come into the edges of the wood, Anfei said. The Demhorak cities are fighting, so they keep raiding for new intelligent bodies to shore up their losses. Are you safe here? Dan Moy asked. Them Horak wars don't last long. They forget what they were fighting over and stop, Anfei joked, with concerning disregard. This one is a bit worse than usual, but they stick to the shore and the plains mainly. Again, one and I can defend our own just fine. Okay, but if it were to get bad, you'd be welcome in Far Camp or Tilt Town, Danway suggested. They have good soldiers and weapons. We'll go to Genwin's family if it gets bad. Don't worry about it, Anfei said dismissively. Underneath the table, Danmoy scrunched his toes, leaving marks on the wood floor. From what he'd gathered reading his old journals, past Danmoy had always found his brother irresponsible, while their older sister thought they both were. It seemed this hadn't completely changed with parenthood or memory loss. From the foggy, discontinuous memory he had of their dream travels, Anfei had always been annoyingly clever-tongued and dangerously brave. Danmoy took his hard memory out and tucked his new portrait between the pages for safekeeping. The other month, a group going to Far Camp got scattered. I remember you mentioning it, Anfei said, taking a piece of bread for himself. Probably Tickle or Shefoy's doing. I think old Shefoy prefers intelligent prey. But it could also have been raiders from the warring Demhorak cities, Danway said, in which case some of them might still be alive. On their second lives, more likely, Anfei stated the obvious, his bread held delicately between two long, thin fingers, like you and I. One of them has siblings that have come to find him, Dan Moy explained. I was thinking I might help them. Why? I don't know, Dan Moy said quietly. Sympathy? Even if his body lives, they'll be disappointed, like Ereha. I'm not disappointed I found you, Dan Moy told him. There was a gap in the conversation with only the sounds of little Lachine scribbling on her notebook. She was drawing a mystery animal of some kind, which seemed to have hooves and long tufted ears. Maybe it was the one they'd gotten the milk for the butter from. Well, they're looking regardless, just like I did. I could give them better odds, Danway qualified it. Which two cities are fighting? Prest and Biete, Anfei answered. Maybe Uwa Wu too. Hard to tell with them. I can put word to the Tepoy towns again and ask them if they'd taken in any lost outsiders, again when offered helpfully. Though it's unlikely, I think we would have heard by now. Thank you, Danmoy said. You should go visit the Tepoy in Huanan yourself. I have a pretty friend who'd like your tale, Genwin told him. Oh, Danmoy muttered, cut off guard again. I don't think I'm at a good time for that at the moment. It will never be a good time for it if you don't look for the right person, Anfei chided him. I could give you some introductions. Thankfully, Danmoy was incapable of sweating with his altered skin and it always made him appear far less agitated than he was. 
Though he held his face serene behind his glasses, his mind was a tumultuous slurry of thoughts at the idea of seeking companionship in his current state, as much as part of him might have wanted it. Can you betray a woman you don't remember? Was it safe with the bladed tail he was only half in control of? And how did you even approach these things? Whatever experience he'd had with women, he'd completely forgotten. He couldn't sweat, but he could blush a vibrant shade of blue-green, and he cleared his throat to stave it off and maintain his facade of reserve. What are those things you wear on your face? Lachine piped up. They're called glasses, he told her, thankful for the interruption. Why do you wear them? To pander to people who don't like him, Anne Faye answered, leaning forward and smirking again before popping the last bit of his bread in his mouth. Danmoy glared at him for not being wrong but he had a response ready this time. The glasses belong to someone I loved, Damoy said, so they're special, and they make everything look green, which reminds me of the other world when I'm missing it. Can I look through them? She asked, already half climbing onto the table to take them. I want to see what the other world looks like. He slid them across the table to her with far more trust than anyone should have in a four-year-old's restraint. Hi listeners, this is your friendly internet narrator, minus all the bloopers that were edited out. I was really tripping over my own tongue today. You may have noticed this episode was a bit short. We are doing some half-sized episodes this month and next month because we're gearing up for some events. And we're really having to just pull time out of our butts to get everything done. But it's important to us that this story grows every month, so we are, you know, we make time for it. Uh, today, we'd like you to vote on how many days Dan Moy should stay to gather information around Far Camp. You can pick any number from 1 to 5, and the result will be the average of the votes. So you have until next week to pick a number from 1 to 5 and put it in the comments here or under the Instagram post. All our social media links are below. Now we're going to roll for what happens to Dan Moy's precious glasses from his forgotten lost love because he's trusting an energetic four-year-old with them. And the end of fate has rolled at 33. The glasses survive with only smudges. Thanks for listening and have an awesome month. See you next time.